<coughs> right. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. <coughs> Welcome to uh, Christchurch live stream with the two Steves. The two Steves, Sean. Sure. So I was <coughs> talking before we noticed we've got uh, several things in common, haven't we, Steve? We're we both, have. Uh, so we both, um, both have maths as our training, like I talked about last time, but also we discovered we both speak Russian. Yeah, we're both Russian speakers, <laughs> maths involvement. It's uh, indistinguishable. You can choose which ones are more handsome, but I wouldn't go for me. <laughs> so th the other thing, Steve, you said before, before you said uh, whether there was a... Uh, whether there's a collective noun for Steve's. The plurality of Steve's. Yes, what? do you think, you think there ought to be a word? Uh, uh, Stephanos, yeah. <laughs> which would be the Greek for a singular. I don't know what it would do be. You, for. Do you know what Stephanos means? The victory crown. It's the crown, yes. Yeah. And in the, um, given that we just finished the Olympics, it seems rather appropriate. It does the, indeed. Um, the, 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 and in fact, in, is it in, is it one, I looked at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it talks about athletes striving for a crown that perishes. Mm hmm. And, uh, we strive for the one that's incorruptible. Absolutely. So I wonder whether a, whether a, a collective noun for, a, for a, a group of Steves should be a podium. A podium of Steves. Yeah. I like that. That <laughs> works for me. And we're on a podium. We're so on a podium, yes. Yeah. Right, yeah, so, uh, <coughs> and if you were to stand up, you'd be higher than me, so you get the gold. I'll just come in as a silvery bronze. Be higher than you? I don't think so. Yeah, on the camera you will be, see? Oh, yes, OK. Well, <laughs> that's only because the camera is like I know. It's, <laughs> let's not try to explain that one. <laughs> He's a very tall Steve, and I'm a much shorter yeah, one. Yeah. Now, the camera is set for this view, so that I'm sitting down. If I stand up, you, you can't see my head. <laughs> I think people will pay good money not to see mine. <laughs> so, what are we doing today, then? Yeah. But anyway, so just come back to crowns. Mm. I was think, thinking a, a podium of Steve's might be quite good. Yes. But then I also realised that the same word is used in Revelation where it talks about the 24 elders wearing golden crowns. It's the same mm. word, Stephanos. Yeah, and casting them at the feet <laughs> yeah. of... So I, I don't know, I have this, I have this picture of, uh, of that. I don't know, I have, I have a very um, sort of literal imagination. I have this picture of these 24 elders all in their long white robes, all wearing crowns which are battered and half the jewels missing. Mm -hmm. from the continuously throwing them on the ground in front of the lamb on the throne. Well, I've never thought about that before till today, but now I will not be able to erase <laughs> it from my mind for a full week, I reckon. Yes, yeah, so, so I this, have, this, have this line of 24 gentlemen, all, all with long flowing beards and, and glowing white robes and crowns which are falling apart and battered mm. and, uh, and bent from being thrown on the ground. What could it be that as we go through our weekly lives that the Father's looking at us already as wearing slightly battered crowns. Mm. We're already victorious through the Lamb, we have our crown, but yeah. maybe it's a bit battered this morning. <laughs> Mine is. <laughs> I don't know about yours. So let me think, perhaps, perhaps rather than a podium of Steve's, we should have an eldership of Steve's. And, uh, and with podium, I, I like the podium idea. Yeah, the podium. A, <laughs> I, I nev that would never have come to me, I really like that one. A podium of Steve's. Or an eldership, but well, that's a bit too literal. The podium well, is, yes. is yeah. good allegorical one. So good morning, everybody, and it's great to welcome you. We're all here, worshipping God wherever we are. I believe some people may be tuning in from other parts of the world, even Uganda, I believe. So good morning to you, if that's where you are, Jambo. So what are we doing today? What have we got? What's coming up? We're going to worship. We're going to look at the Word of God together, and I'm going to be speaking about uh, the prodigal son, and um, I've done that a couple of times before, well, many times actually, in various places, but uh, something new came to me a few months ago, so we're going to be looking at that, and if you're feeling like uh, maybe you've strayed a long way, you've gone far from home as a Christian, today's a good morning to tune in and receive the welcome home from the Father. Welcome home. Do you, do you think it's possible to have a stray too far that you can't come home? I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. No. I think there's, that God's ever directing you back. <coughs> I like that um, that phrase in is it one Timothy, that's just a Timothy where he talks about the all scripture is useful and he talks about it being a word of reproof and it seems to be like a 
like a, a like a no entry sign or a stop sign that says don't go any further this way mm -hmm. but also there's also always a way back yeah and i mean i'm not speaking about this on the prodigal summer i remember a few years ago one of the points that came out of the story was it, it says that the prodigal son went to a far country so he was a long long way from the father and I found it especially encouraging that when the father spots him, he says that while he was still far off, the father saw him. Yeah. So even though he's still a long, long way away, yeah. Not he far, just he made one decision to go home, the yeah. father could yeah. see him already. He, was, he wasn't quite as far away as he was, but yeah, that's, that's all. One yeah. little decision yeah. Yeah. to go home. And he didn't wait till he came near, he didn't wait till he got his life sorted out. He was still far off when the father saw mm. him and ran to meet him. Yeah. And uh, that's yeah. not exactly what I'm talking about, but I always find that you know, I find that I'm strayed and yeah. I need to get back home. I remember the father sees me even when I'm a long way away and he comes running towards me. And that's our God. That's the God yeah. we serve. Yeah. Let's think about my literal imagination. I always think this, this, this guy, he's, he's in the pigsty when, he's, yeah. when he comes to his senses. Uh -huh. And he gets there and he says, I'll go to my father. And he says, his, fa his father rushes to him when he's still far away and embraces him. Mm -hmm. and then he puts the best robe on him yeah. but there's no indication he had a bath first oh that's true <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a very good point he puts a robe on him and maybe he's still a bit smelly mm. well, that's a glorious thing about salvation it's instantaneous yeah. that moment when you decide to turn to Jesus it doesn't wait for you to amend your life get yourself sorted out immediately he adopts you into his family mm. that's wonderful he starts a work of Cleaning all the smelly pig stuff off of you. That's right, yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it at that, shall we? Yeah. But I think it's interesting too, because he doesn't just go to a far country, mm -hmm. so, he's, so he's far away physically, but also because of the, the pigsty and, and yeah. he's far away mentally, he's far away spiritually, he's mm -hmm. far away in every possible domain, isn't he? Every ethical code that they have yeah. in their religion, he broke it. That's right. Spent his money on prostitutes and yeah. earned his money feeding yeah. pigs. So he's, He's, he's not just far away in a far country, so he's on, on every level of, of human experience he's far away. Mm -hmm. And it's when he's at his lowest, when, when, he's, when he's as far away as he can possibly be. And that's when I became a Christian, when I was 19 years old, I was mm -hmm. as far away as I could be, as low as I ever had been in my life. I couldn't think of any reason to get up in the morning anymore, and that's when yeah. I thought I would go to my father, and he mm -hmm. saw me and mm -hmm. ran towards me. And everything changed, and I'm still standing. Yep. 38 years later. Yeah. Gave my age away then. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you can do the maths. <laughs> well, which I can, of course. <laughs> <laughs> do it without your calculator because you've got the sums. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how, um, I mean, I don't know how you became a Christian, but I, uh, I look back at my story, and um, one of the things I. Uh, I forgot about it for many, many years. Is um, have you heard of a musician called Adrian Snell? Mm. He came to the Methodist Hall in Wigan. Is it Victoria Hall or something? Yeah, yeah. Or oh, is it Queen's Hall? Queen's Hall. That's it. Yeah. He came there, and I, it was. I think I was seven. I was doing A level, so I was maybe seventeen years old, and um, I was raised in the church. And of course, at the end of every service, you say the Our Father. And a strange thing happened. I was really into Genesis and keyboard music. And a girl who was a Christian at the deanery, I didn't know she was a Christian, she, she invited me to go to this concert. And um, it was good. I enjoyed his keyboard playing and the music. And at the end of the service, oh, sorry, the end of the concert, he sang the Our Father. And I could still see him. Um, he sat at the piano and, and began to sing. And as he sang it, he was looking up. And I had this scary feeling. I began to, was, I know now I call it the fear of God. I realized that he was singing to his father. Mm. And I'd said that prayer religiously every Sunday for donkey's years. Yeah. Donkey's <coughs> years. And I never thought about God as my father. And I became afraid. And I was there with my girlfriend. We'd gone to, to this concert. And when we were leaving, I'd lost the ability to speak. I couldn't talk. I was silent. I was, my, I was mouthing words. And it was fear. It was terror. I was terrified of God. <laughs> because I thought, I've, I've been saying these prayers and it's meant nothing to me. And two years later, I became a Christian. I, I looked back and thought, oh, 
God was trying to get my attention right there at that concert. And the weird thing was, when I became a missionary in, um, in St. Petersburg, Adrian Snell supported our ministry. Mm. Uh, I got to meet the treasurers of his ministry and went to his house and we talked about the concert and I got to tell him the story and he put it in one of his biographies the, oh, where this okay. kid from Wigan who got terrified. <laughs> and I met the guy and I didn't know what was happening and I just, I was terrified. Mm. And God was trying to get a hold of my attention. It took two more years but he got that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> my advice was not quite the same as that, but I was brought up in the, in the Church of England. I went to, start, went to the church twice every Sunday from when I was about eight, right through to my teens. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was seven, again, it's a similar sort of age, 17, which is slightly longer ago than when you were 17, that happens. But uh, um, Good Friday, the, um, the vicar had uh, it got to know some people from the local Assemblies of God Church, and he invited them to come along to, the, to a joint Good Friday service. Mm -hmm. And they gave testimonies, which I'd never heard before. Oh, well, yeah. So this, this yeah. idea that you could know God personally and know Jesus personally, although I'd been in the church for at that time, I don't know, 10, I don't know, yeah, 10 11 years, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Perhaps not quite long. Been to Sunday school before that. This message had never actually impinged. Like you said, so, it, so the personality of it, or, or it being a personal relationship, had just never, mm -hmm. never entered my consciousness. So um, yeah, so I um, yeah, so I gave my life to the Lord that night, um, and yeah, so I so said the rest is history, mm. which is that, but that's fifty three years ago. Well, I, I gave up on Christianity. I stopped going to church. I just mm. I used to look at the crucifix at the back of the church, uh, and I mean I've always been a thinker, mm. like you are, literally. Yeah. So I used to look at this dying Christ and think, well, surely if He died for my sins. That's important, but I couldn't see any difference in the lives of the people in the no, church yeah, from everyone yeah. outside. So I gave up and I, I, mm. I looked into Buddhism and I thought I was a Buddhist and was in the Hall of Residence when I was 19 years old at university and walking along the corridor and I thought I heard a stereo. There were some people and I found out it was real living people, not a stereo, singing folky music in this bedroom. And I was so into music, I knocked on the door and said, what's going on? And they invited me in and there were four of them. <clears throat> they had a guitar and they were singing mm. to Jesus mm. and it freaked me out I was thinking but this is not Sunday <laughs> why are you singing about Jesus and yeah. it's not a Sunday <clears throat> and I realised that these people actually had a relationship with God and it wasn't mm. just a Sunday thing they wanted to worship him they were doing it because they enjoyed it yeah. and that was I think that was a Saturday night and they gave me a New Testament and I read the whole thing by the Sunday morning and I went looking for them again and they took me to church with them. And just before we went to church, I prayed the sinner's prayer and asked if I could you know, be forgiven and yeah. get whatever it was that they had and become a Christian. And that was it, that was yeah. December, whatever year that was, when I was 19. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna say. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, I'm doing remember. the maths. <laughs> I'm to remember. It was a long time ago, let's yeah. put it that way. I was yeah. 19 years old. <laughs> oh dear me, I'm still yeah. serving God now. Yeah. When I went up to university, the um, I was obviously with a lot of other people who had not met before, and we started going out and going drinking and that sort of thing. Mm. But the the Christian Union in college oh, somehow yes. all realised I was a Christian, and so they set they set one of their members to go fetch. Oh right. <laughs> so, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember the students' union bar. Yeah. So so no so this this other Christian came and he actually sort of came alongside me and sort of basically steered me away from these other people back into the into the Christian Union. And this guy's now Bishop of Peterborough. <laughs> oh. So, oh. So high places. Yeah, so mm. he, he was a he was a medical student in those days. But so. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. We're sitting here at the, the podium of Steve's. That's right. That's discussing our stories about how we uh, became yeah. Christians and why we're here, why we're doing what we're doing. It's yeah. um, it's glorious when God gets hold of somebody and starts to change their lives. And I had, a, I had a preacher friend who used to always say when he recalled it on a Sunday morning that he may not be what he should be, but thank God he's not what he used to be. And yes. I think that's how we feel about it. That's right, yeah. You know, yeah. we're not perfect, yeah. but yeah. we're not what we used <coughs> to be. I'm not the angry young man no. that I used to be, and I'm hoping I'm not the angry older man that I... <laughs> I'm hoping a lot of the anger's gone. Mm. But I used to be a very angry person. Mm. I'm less angry now. Yeah. 
One of the, there's, there's, a, there's a wonderful verse in John's first letter where it says, brothers, we are God's children now, mm -hmm. but it doesn't yet appear yeah. what we shall be. Yeah. But we know mm. that when he appears, we shall be like him, mm -hmm. but we shall see him as he is. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> a friend of mine used to speak about it. He was also called Stephen. And he, he always referred to Stephen in the Bible in Acts, in Acts 7. And don't you remember the story that Stephen was being, was being stoned to death? Yes. And he said, he said he saw Jesus standing in heaven, it says, mm -hmm. and he prayed, Father, don't, do not lay this sin against them. Mm -hmm. In other words, he saw Jesus as he was, and he became like him. Mm. It says in Corinthians that we see in a mirror dimly. Mm. You know, it's, it's a distorted image, but that image, we were made in the image of God, and that image is distorted, but by the new birth, we're gradually being reformed back into the image of God. And I can see, I can see the difference in my life. It's not always instantaneous. It's... I am more of the person that I want to be now than I was. I always wanted to be this nice, kind, peaceful person. And I failed miserably. I was really angry. I remember I, um, when I was 14 or 15 years old, I was a hippie, a hippie in Wigan. I used to wear kaftan with big sleeves and Jesus sandals in winter and love beads. And uh, I was into peace, love and understanding. Can you imagine being a, in the 70s being a hippie in Wigan? Um, it took some courage. You've got to... Imagine, yeah. <laughs> my, my sister used to hide in shop doorways when she saw me walking through the town centre because I had this purple caftan on, long hair. And I, I really wanted to practice peace, love and understanding, but I was a very angry person. And um, I don't know if any of you remember Smith's Bookstore in Wigan. Um, we had a record section. I was into my music. <laughs> And I went in there once. I got banned anyway. <laughs> I was wearing my peace, love and understanding outfit and I was really trying to practice peace. And there was a skinhead in there, took the mickey out of me, so I hit him. But you know, really into peace, love and understanding. Ended up in a brawl, knocked the records all over the place, got kicked out and got banned for life. So much for the peace that was in my heart. <laughs> what a failure. <laughs> but I wanted to be peaceful. I just wasn't very good at it. Yeah. I'm probably still banned, but I think the bookshop's gone. Yeah, it's, so. probably, it's probably moot now. <laughs> <laughs> but God helps us to become that dream we have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we know we should be. We, we're not quite what we should be, but we're not what we used to be. We're gradually moving towards yeah. perfection and maturity. Yeah. It's interesting you say you were you're, you're angry before you came oh, to so I wasn't nice. I was, I was outwardly yeah. nice. Yeah. But what, but what I realised is I was self-righteous, and oh. that's worse. Mm -hmm. At least, at least if you're angry, it's visible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think that my anger came from feeling I was always right, and if you argue with me, you were wrong. So it's the same thing. Righteousness. <laughs> yes, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. you know, whatever I did was the right thing to do. Oh, what a shambles I was. Yes, well, thank so. God for his grace. Yeah. With, 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 with this, a case, this a case of, of those of you who think you're always right or annoying those of us that are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Until you meet somebody who knows a lot more than you do and you find out that they can show you that you were wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Now, I'm used to being wrong. <laughs> I accept it and apologise. <laughs> so, we're getting close to the start of the service. Yeah. And what are we doing during the service today, Steve? What have we got besides the sermon, of course? Yeah, we've got um, <coughs> having a slightly extended time of worship like we did last time I led. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Judith Phillips doing the Bible reading. Is Judith here? Yes, I can't see her. How did you choose the songs today? I know you've chosen them and they're looking good to me. What were <coughs> you thinking? Well, the thinking was really... I had the advantage of you having told me what the theme was. <laughs> yeah. it does Which usually, usually helps. <laughs> so I wasn't going blind, as it were. So, uh, and it was, it was this thing about about the Father, but also God's grace. Mm -hmm. So it was important. Um, um, God wanting us, God wanting us with Him, fellowship. Mm -hmm. I think it was important. Um, and I think we forget that, don't we? That uh, we enjoy fellowship with God, but He actually wants that fellowship with us. That, yeah. And that's the amazing thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Well, God is love. And he longs to express that love towards somebody. So he made us knowing that we will fail. And through his grace, he gets to express the love. I always think when I, I mean, we're talking about the prodigal son about, I don't know how old the father was, but the son had been gone for, he was probably a bit of an elderly man. And the idea of uh, when he sees his son returning, he hitches up his skirts, kicks off his sandals, and starts to run as fast as he can to get to his son. Mm. What an expression of how much God wants to be with us. And if you make that decision to be close to God, he does the rest of the work. Mm. He runs towards you. And by his grace, he can bring you home. And I always think as I look at your songs, you've got amazing grace there. And good, good father. That If you feel that it's not in you to get home, don't worry. Just make the decision to go mm. home and watch what God does. He'll come running towards you and he'll bring you home. And that's all we need to do. It's yes. never hopeless as a Christian, yeah. never. Yeah, it's just one step in the right direction and then after that, God takes mm -hmm. over. Yeah. Just move home slowly. You see this elderly father running towards you through the desert to get you home. What a glorious image of a good God. He is a good, good father. You better say something, I'm in danger of preaching okay, my sorry. sermon before, yeah, yeah. <laughs> before the <laughs> <sermon> <laughs> my, my wife's just gesticulating at me, so she can't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, yeah, the sound is not perfect at the moment, but the great advantage I have as a preacher is I don't actually need a microphone. I've got a really big mouth. Yeah. I learned to preach on the streets, yeah. on Market Street in Manchester. That was my first ever pulpit, Saturday after Saturday, and now I'm very loud. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's got the uh, live stream on, whether they, can, whether they can hear us on the live stream. It's always good to have a sound Maybe check. <coughs> Someone can message to say whether they can hear us on the live stream. Yeah. Well, have you got somewhere to read the messages? I, I haven't. <coughs> well, that's a good test, actually, because if nobody does messages, that answers the question. It does, yes. Because they can't hear us on the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Heather's having a look for us. So we've got five minutes to go. Um, yeah. Just seeing this here. It's nice to see the church gradually filling up. There's not so many here yet. It's, it's amazing how, 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 the, how there's a big rush in the last five minutes. I, um, I won't get to mention it in um, the sermon, but one of the things I remember when I prepared my message is I used to go with my dad fishing to Ireland every year at Shannon Bridge and uh, we caught some really big fish there and I was raised Roman Catholic and I used to go to Mass at Shannon Bridge um, every Sunday morning when we went fishing and I, I arrived in church one day and it was a farming community and everyone was dressed in the Sunday finest and I, I was standing, I think I was 14 years old, looking around and thinking what's wrong with this picture? And I realised everybody was wearing Sunday frocks or suits, but they all had wellies on <laughs> underneath them. And then, when I was 14, there was this almighty clatter, and the door burst open, and this farmer, who wasn't wearing his Sunday vest, was still in his dirty farm, came running up the aisle of church and threw himself on his face in front of the altar, crying. And I don't know what had happened or why he'd done it, mm -hmm. But I had this feeling that that man felt he really needed to be in church. Yeah. And I think that's a very good way to arrive in church on a Sunday morning. So if anybody wants to come running up the aisle and prostrate themselves weeping, then we know that's why you're supposed to come to church. Yeah, because doing something, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get close to God. And if you ever feel like, I don't know what he'd done, what had happened in his life, but that made a dramatic impression mm -hmm. on me that I never felt the urgency to get to church. But I do these days, I sometimes yeah. think, yeah, I need to go and worship. I need to pray. I need to be close to God. We can do that anywhere. But this is that sacred time when you can get away from everything else and focus just on serving God for an hour and worshipping. So I'm praying I'll be in that spirit today. Yeah, absolutely, yes. <clears throat> so the, the notes on the, uh, on the service plan doesn't have a theme. I didn't put it on, but it's... We talk about the, the Father's love and grace. Mm. Good. Yeah. And the older son, that's who we're looking at very closely today. 
all shall be revealed later. So we've got a couple of minutes. Have we got the um, the thing queued up, Garth? The clock? Yes, okay. Not, not yet. Two minutes. <laughs> so I think coming to God with expectation, it's not just another Sunday, not just another time to sing, Let's expect to meet with God today. Mm. See what God can do. Because he's here. He was here before we arrived. Yep. And he'd love to meet with his people. So bring all your issues, your ailments, your sins. Let's get close to God and see what he can do to us. I want to go out of here a bit different than how I came in. <laughs> There's my ambition. Some people are saying I need to be a lot different than that, probably. Right. <laughs> I'm sure at least a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're all works in progress, aren't we? Oh yes. And, um, <laughs> it stalls sometimes, <laughs> but it'll continue later. Okay, so <clears throat> just going to clear the decks a bit so far, just to find out. So is your, is your phone on silent? Yes, and a long way away because it interferes okay. with the microphones. So if you see me running around later, it's because I've forgotten where I left my phone. I'm just telling you it's on the queue over there so you can remind me when I can't find it later because <laughs> that's what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, change the view so I can stand up. You're still taller than me. There's an expert for Alison to come soon. <coughs> okay, Garth, do you want to uh, start the, the timer? So good morning everyone and welcome to uh, this service at Christchurch Pennington. Um, <clears throat> this morning we have two Steves leading and we decided at the beginning of the service that as Steve means a crown, that we did the Olympics, that the, the, the word for a, a group of Steves is a podium. So, so we, we, we led by a podium of Steves this morning. And Steve H is slightly higher than me so guess who got the gold. <laughs> so. We're going to start by just saying, just praying together. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And mm. also with you. Oh, sorry. There we go. Sorry. So say, I'll say that again. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let, Let us, us rejoice, rejoice and be, and be glad, glad in it. <clears throat> Blessed are you, sovereign God, creator of all. To you be glory and praise forever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time, 
you made us in your image. And in these last days, you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Your Spirit ever renew our lives, and your praise is ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed, Blessed be, be God, God forever. <clears throat> We're going to have a, a slightly extended time of worship. We're going to have three songs together like we did uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the theme of these songs is all to do with, with God the Father, of his love and his grace. And the first one is, this is our God. And he's talking about his grace being more than we need and about his presence being with us. So, this is our God, thank you.
going to sing a song that, uh, that's about our Father having prepared a home for us in eternity. But even though we're not there yet, he's with us as we walk on this earth. So abide with me. Thank you. Abide with me
Father, we just thank you for that love that will never let us go. Thank you that you are love. It's who you are. And thank you that knowing your love is just part of our experience. I'm going to sing, Good, Good Father, thank you. love and God's closeness we still often don't do what's right in his eyes so we're going to say the confession together God our heaven God our father we come to you in sorrow for our sins for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives father forgive us father forgive us save us and help us for behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. 
Save Amen. us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say, Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us, Father, forgive us. Save, Save us, us and, and help, help us. <coughs> May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Now Judith is going to read to us. This morning's reading is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, beginning to read at verse 11. The parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give my sh me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went out and hired himself to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed for his stomach to be filled with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. <clears throat> now Steve's going to come and speak to us. Good morning. 
Well, that was enthusiastic. All the people in Viewerland are a bit more enthusiastic. That's more like you, John. Thank you. We have one enthusiastic person in the house. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It is great to be in church. And there's the theme on the screen that I want to talk to you about, the prodigal and the older brother. Um, I've preached on this parable many, many times. And I've preached on it here at Christ Church, I think maybe twice already. And to be honest, I made the mistake of thinking I covered the parable fairly well and there was not much else to say. <laughs> now, I should know better than to do that with God's word <laughs> because something will always happen when you start to think like that. So I want to share um, a bit of a story with you. Let's pray. Father, Father, I glimpse you this morning running towards us. I want to remember, I want us all to remember that that is the kind of <coughs> Father we serve, that when we fail, and we do fail, when we make that decision to come to our senses and come to you, we will see you afar off, running with all of your speed, all of your might to get us and to get us home. Father, come and bring the wanderers home today. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyway, about 10 months ago, a friend of mine, I've been trying to preach a sermon for 10 months, I've been asking Alan, so wherever Alan is, thank you, we finally got there. After 10 months, a friend of mine who's an evangelist and a pastor in the Democratic Republic of Congo posted on Facebook um, a simple question for reflection something he'd been dwelling on and meditating on, and he posted this and asked all of his friends to, to reflect on it. And it kind of had a real impact on me when I, I don't know how other people reacted, but when I thought about this for some time, I began to really consider some things. And this is the reflection he posted. He said, what would have happened if the prodigal son had met the older brother when he returned from his sinful lifestyle? rather than his father. Now we know the story that when he set off for home, his father spied him from a distance and ran towards him and embraced him and kissed him. He met his father first. But what would have happened, my friend Joseph said, if he had met the elder brother first? And it began to stir something within my heart that I needed to deal with. Well, many issues, as always, I need to deal with in my life. Let's have a little background from this here parable. In the beginning of, the, there are three parables in Luke chapter 15. Uh, before Jesus begins to tell the stories, it says this in chapter 15 verse 1. I'm reading from the Amplified Translation because I find sometimes it gets to the heart of things a little bit better. It says, now the tax collectors and notorious and especially wicked sinners were all coming near to Jesus to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes kept muttering and indignantly complaining, saying, This man accepts and receives and welcomes preeminently wicked sinners and eats with them. Do you see how it gets to the number of things that the scribes and Pharisees are grumbling and murmuring about these people? And in Greek, it uses some very strong words to describe the sinners that are coming to Jesus. It says that they were notorious, preeminent sinners. These were poorly living people, people who were abandoning all ethical values, all morality, all religion, and they were off in the world doing whatever they want to do. There were two groups here. The religious leaders who were typified in our parable by the older brother and some notorious sinners. I like that phrase, notorious. Everyone knew about these people. They're typified by the prodigal son. And the first thing that stood out to me when I read this was, it says, and I find this interesting, that particularly wicked sinners were all trying to get close to Jesus. What a thought. These aren't just people who've cheated on their tax returns. These were people who were out there doing crime, doing all kinds of immoral things. But when they met Jesus, they wanted to get close to him. And they wanted to listen to him. Is that how we see people who are doing whatever they're doing in the world? Do we still see them trying to get close to Jesus? And if not, let's ask ourselves why. And something that 
We need to bear in mind, and that helps to clarify this parable. There's another parable that Jesus told was the Pharisee and the tax collector. And it's introduced in Luke chapter 18 with these words. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. That's before the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. People who were confident that they were always doing the right thing and looked down on moral failures. He told them another parable. Now, the reason I say this is in our story, these people, the self-righteous, the moral people who think they're superior to everybody else, they're typified <clears throat> in the older brother. And we're going to look at him a little bit more closely. And I want you to consider something for me. Consider this. Maybe the greatest privilege and the greatest responsibility in this post-Christian era when the majority of people do not believe the Bible, they don't believe it's the word of The majority of people do not attend church. Maybe the greatest privilege and the greatest responsibility is that the greatest impact comes to them from the lives of everyday Christians. The most persuasive thing that could turn them towards Jesus is our lives. They don't come to church. They don't believe the Bible is the word of God. But they meet us every day. And we can have a significant impact on their lives. And Jesus said this. He made it very clear that this is the way things go. When we looked at the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, we looked at this passage. It says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You have a significant impact everywhere you go. People aren't looking in the Bible for answers. They aren't attending church, but they hear you. They see you. And something about the light that shines in you can be very winsome. It also says in 1 Peter chapter 2, Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good <clears throat> deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This kind of thing is repeated many times in the New Testament. That we have a treasure in earthen vessels. There's something excellent, something glorious, something shining in our lives. And when we allow that to manifest itself in our character, in our words, in our actions, it can have a real impact on other people's lives. But we need to ask this question. What do people see when they see us? What do they hear? What do they feel? And this was Jesus' issue with the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day. The lost and the sinful, they pressed in to see Jesus because there was something authentic about him, something real. Jesus said in John 14, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. They pressed in, they wanted to hear him because there was something of God in this man. But there was very little of the authentic in the religious leaders of the day. And this is what angered Jesus. He posed the question, where are people going to see God? They see the religious leaders and their hypocrisy and the death of their religion. He wanted them to see something authentic and vibrant. If the prodigal son had met the elder son instead of the father, then I'd like to address three false impressions of God that they would have seen in the words and character of the older son. The three are, they would have believed that forgiveness is only partial. <clears throat> they believe that something of the character of God is we only receive if we give. And they would have resented the joy of other people because the older brother resented joy when he saw it. The first one is, they would have believed that God only allows a partial forgiveness. Let's go back to our story. 
The prodigal son, it says in verses 17 to 19, rereading our story, when he came to his senses, he's away from home, a long, long way from home. He's living with the pigs. He's spending his money on prostitutes and party lifestyles. He's lost. He's gone. But it says that when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I just want to be a slave, a servant in your house. Just let me come home. At least I can eat. I'll have a job. Put a roof over my head. I'll be nothing in your house. But at least I'll come home. Now, the older brother, if he had heard these words, he would have agreed with this. He would have told his brother, if he had set off to meet his brother instead of the father, he would have encountered him somewhere in the wasteland as he travelled home, and his brother would have said, I've messed up, I want to come back as a servant. The older brother would have said, yeah, you'll never amount to much. You won't have a real place in the father's heart anymore, but yeah, we'll give you a roof over your head. You can stumble home. You will never amount to anything. It's probably best if you become one of the servants. Look at the words of the older brother when he spoke to his father. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. In verse 30 of our text it says, when the older brother speaks to his father, when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. When this son of yours comes home, not when my brother comes home, he's not my brother anymore, I don't see him as a brother, he's a waster, he's a loser, he might still be your son, but he's nothing to me. He's not my brother. There's only a partial forgiveness. Let him sleep in the cellar, let him sleep under the stairs, let him be nothing in the kingdom. At least he's come home. That's all he is to me. He's nothing. But that is not how God sees us. When we fail, when we sin, when we are lost and far, far from home, he meets us running through the desert. He embraces us. He wraps his arms around us and kisses us and takes us back with all the rights and privileges of a son, of a daughter, of God. It says, the older brother might say to us, you know what? You're nothing. But if we can just... Sure, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Our God's forgiveness is full and it is free. It is not sleep under the stairs, no. It's wear the robe, wear the ring. Come to the party, will slay the fatty calf. All is forgiven. I am glad my child has come home. That's what the father said. But the older brother would have said no. There is only a partial forgiveness. You can come home, but you'll amount to nothing. No child of God. You are everything. You are the apple of the father's eye. And your name is written on his palm. Welcome home. The other thing that he would have learned from the older brother is that you only receive if you give something to God. Do you know the prodigal had nothing to give his father? He spent all of his inheritance. There was nothing left. All he had to offer was shame, sin, and a confession. That's all he had. But the older brother, how was his reaction? In verse 29... He answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Do you see that vision of God that this religious man has? All these years I've been slaving for you. If I've been slaving for him, that means that my God is a slave master. Is that your God? This is truly the vision of religiosity and legalism. In Matthew 23 and verse 4, it says these words. 
The religious leaders, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Is your religion heavy, cumbersome, always trying to be moral, do the right thing, beating yourself up when you fail? Do you look around you and see that other people are struggling and you sit in judgment on them? Is your religion heavy? Is it hard? Is it cruel? Because that's not the God that we serve. Listen to what Jesus said about cumbersome heavy loads. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That is not the elder brother's religion, is it? He said, I've slaved for you. I've never done anything wrong, but you don't give me anything. Is that your relationship with God? Do you feel you've done your best? You always try your hardest, so God needs to bless you now? Do you think that you inherit salvation and mercy and heaven and forgiveness and all those glories of the Bible because you've done something right? Or is it what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8? It is by grace you have been saved, through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not by works, so that no one can boast. We can't boast about our salvation. The older brother was boasting about his works. He believed his father owed him something. And the younger brother came home weeping and fell on his face. And his father scooped him up in his arms and embraced him and loved him and forgave him and clothed him in righteousness. This is our God. This is how he responds when we fail. And the other thing that we can learn about the older brother and his relationship with religion and faith and his father, look at this. He resented the joy of others. He resented joy. I've kind of edited two halves of verses together. These are verses 25, the second part, verse 28, the first part. It says, when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, and the older brother became angry and refused to go in. He didn't like that celebration. He didn't like the noisy clamor of the house, the party that's going on, because a sinner has returned. In verse 7 of our text, in Luke 15, sorry, of our chapter, not of our text, Luke chapter 15, verse 7, it says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. There is a noisy celebration when a lost sinner comes to Christ. Heaven sings and rejoices. Do you ever sit in church and think, I'm a pretty good person, you know. I do well, I'm kind, I'm loving, I'm giving. And, and you look at those awful people outside and think, I'm so glad I'm not like that. I had a thought, I don't know what you make of this. If a horrible sinner repents and comes to Christ, would you rather see them in a Christian biography than on the pew next to you? We love reading those books, don't we? Drug dealers come to Christ. Notorious drunkards come to Christ. Bank robbers come to Christ. Lying politicians come to Christ. Really? Well, sometimes. Oh yeah, I want to read about them. But would you like them sitting in the seat next to you in church? I'll leave that one with you after think about that. Do we really rejoice when people come to Christ? What about if it was the worst person in town? I don't know who that might be. If they came to Christ, would you be happy to put your arm around them? Well, after lockdown, put your arm around them, embrace them, give them a kiss on the cheek and say, thank you for coming to my church. Do you rejoice 
over one sinner who repents. Don't know if you've ever noticed this verse. And it's only a short sermon today. I'm going to keep it brief. I know I'm not that good at that. But I'm going to leave us with this thought. It says of God, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great, de great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. We serve a singing God. I think it was December the 11th when I still haven't worked out what date it was, what year it was. It was December the 11th though, when I was 19 years old. So 38 years ago, I came to Jesus. It was a Saturday <coughs> evening, going on Sunday morning around midnight. What I didn't know was in that moment when I realized that I couldn't go on the way I was going. I wasn't right. I was wrong. I needed forgiveness. It wasn't anybody else's fault. It was mine. And I believed that Jesus Christ had died for me. He had actually vacated that grave three days later. And he was alive and he was ready to forgive me. What I didn't know was in that moment when I became a Christian, my father started singing. And he's singing now. He's singing over all of us. We are forgiven. We are headed home. And if you're far from him, it is not too late. You serve a singing God. And I'll leave it there. God bless you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sue. That's fantastic. The grace of God. So amazing. <clears throat> and we're going to continue with a song about that, aren't we? Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> Pull myself together. Let's sing with him. Hallelujah. And in fact, I've just realised what we're going to sing. Yep. Yeah. I think we're singing the same song yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. Thank you. Yeah. 
remain standing and we're going to say the creed together <clears throat> let us declare our faith in God we believe in God the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named we believe in God the Son who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love we believe in God the Holy Spirit who strengthens us with power from on high we believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, Alison's going to come and lead us in our intercessions. Father God, today, as we mark Victory in Japan Day, we pray for those areas in the world still experiencing conflict, specifically praying for Afghanistan, where the Taliban have now taken ground of most of the nation. Also for Syria, Iran, the Ukraine, Yemen, Mexico suffering with drug wars, the Congo and the Central African Republic. We pray for each person who lives in fear or whose properties have been damaged or destroyed. We pray for those who are refugees and for those traumatized by conflict and war. We pray also for the country of Haiti where several hundred have been killed and many injured in a huge earthquake. We pray for medical staff, the government, <coughs> support from agencies, and for grieving family and friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. In our own nation, Lord, we pray for the people of Plymouth, where there has been a traumatic loss of life. We pray for those who are feeling shock, distress, fear and sadness. We pray especially for those families who have had a loved one killed or injured. We pray for the investigations that will now take place and for the events that will be held to remember the lives of loved ones. For our nation as a whole, 
we pray as rules around coronavirus change again, meaning that fewer people will now need to isolate. We pray for politicians and scientists as they continue to make hard decisions, balancing the needs of our health and the economy. We pray also for all those young people who this week received exam results. We thank you for those who are pleased and we pray for those who are disappointed. Please guide them, Lord, and help them to make good and wise decisions for their futures. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our local town of Lee. We pray for businesses that have been affected by COVID. We pray for recovery and renewal in our town. We pray for our local councillors as they make decisions about investment and development. We thank you, Lord, for the daylight counselling service and for the increase in counsellors and finance that they have seen. Even so, that there is now a wait to be seen. So we pray for still more workers and for those who are waiting. We ask also for increased admin and IT support and for good relationships with local referrers. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on our whole town of Lee and the local areas surrounding it. In our own church, Lord, we thank you for all those who are volunteering with the Holiday Club. We thank you for their commitment and all the fun the children are having. We pray for its continued success throughout the remainder of the holidays. We pray also for those in our church family who are on holiday themselves. We pray for rest and refreshment. We pray for grace in relationships and for safe travel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those who are sick, including Joy Heathcock, Russ Edison, <coughs> Tony Caldwell and Denise, Margaret Atkinson, Brenda Kershaw, Sandra Foster and Barbara Isherwood. We pray for each person that they would know your care, love, healing touch and provision for them. And among those who are housebound, we pray for Joyce Lester. We thank you, Lord, for Joyce, for those who care for her and her family. May she know a strong sense of your loving presence with her today. Finally, Lord, we take a few moments to pray for ourselves and any who may be on our hearts today. Accept these prayers. For the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, so we are. I'm going to say the, the Lord's. Sorry. <coughs> so we're going to finish our prayers by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, 
now and forever. Amen. <coughs> so, Steph's going to come and give us our notices. Welcome, Steph. I think we Marley. can have Steph as a, an honorary member of the Paul Human Steve. We could do, yes. Very oh, that's very Steve. true. Yes. And my dad's Steve, and that's why I'm Welcome Steph. To the podium. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, everyone. Uh, morning, it's great to be here with you all as always. Um, welcome, whether you're in church or online. Uh, so just another reminder of uh, services we've got coming up. So this <coughs> evening we've got our 6.30 prayer meeting on Zoom. Um, Zoom details were emailed out in the week and I scheduled a reminder to go out this morning so hopefully you've all received that. Um, so please, please join um, this evening if you're, if you're available. Uh, Judith Pitt will be leaving, leading that service as normal. And then next Sunday we've got a 10.30 service and uh, next Sunday is the other 8am that's cancelled. And then after that it will be back onto the normal routine. Uh, just also a quick notice that I wanted to do as sort of part of services. Um, I put in the newsletter just a notice from the welcome team about parking inside the church grounds where you're able to. Um, and when chatting outside maybe don't stand where people might want to come past with cars just to keep everybody safe so thank you for un your understanding on that um, just a reminder to where we are where we are in the week so my email address if there's anything that you need our website of course YouTube channel Facebook and Instagram life groups that I know a couple that have met face to face this week for the first time in a safe way and that, that's been wonderful to hear about and also our prayer ministry especially if anything struck you from Steve's powerful sermon this morning that you just want to share with someone and pray about then please uh, I encourage you to get in touch with our prayer ministry team um, Alan's been busy creating new email addresses so we now have two new ones which are wardens at christchurchpennington.com and info at christchurchpennington.com so if you want to speak to one of the wardens but you don't mind if it's Stephen or Pauline just to make sure someone gets it then email wardens at and if you're not quite sure at all who you need to speak to then the info at goes to me Pauline Stephen Alan and Alan Phillips so I think that covers most bases for everything at the moment. So um, please start to utilise those email addresses if you're not quite sure who it is that you want to speak to. A shout out to our PAYS team. that are sort of Things are starting to move in the background on this. Um, Stephen's taken a wonderful lead in helping to sort all this. So we've got Elizabeth, who's got the stripy dress on. And we've got Karen, who's um, got the plane top on. Elizabeth's from Germany and Karen's from Mexico. So the plan is at the moment that um, Elizabeth's going to be coming to join us on the 24th of August. Um, and then on the 4th of September, she will go to Burnley, Burnley, Burnley to the Pays HQ. Uh, we initially thought she'd need to self-isolate, but because the rules have changed, she doesn't now. So if anyone is around um, before she goes up to Burnley and wants to invite her around for a meal or take her, take her out for a trip somewhere, obviously if she's feeling up to it and ready for that, uh, then please speak to um, Stephen or Debbie Hall and they'll be able to sort that out for you because she will be staying with them initially. Uh, Elizabeth long term is staying with the Leakeys and Karen is staying with Steve and Debbie, but we're not quite sure when Karen's going to be able to come over now because she's in Mexico and at the moment there's now a restriction on people uh, moving in and out of the country. So please keep Karen in your prayers because she was all keyed up, ready to come. Um, Steve and Debbie have been wonderful at keeping in touch with her so she knows that we're ready for her when she is able to be with us um, so yeah just please keep them both in your prayers as they I mean it's normally the unknown isn't it when we have them come over to us they don't know what they're coming to but even more so in these times uh, just a shout out to courses that we've currently got on or sorry starting um, to sort of get people on board for so we've got the prayer course we've got a few people signed up for that now so if you'd want to join if you want to join those then that's wednesday evenings in september and october uh, that's going to be uh, being run by judith um, so it's just it's just basically covers all bases <coughs> of prayer um, so if you struggle with prayer you want to learn more you just want a bit of a refresher and a, a bit of an encouragement by taking part in the course then please email me and there's also the Manchester Diocese course, the Foundations for Ministry. So again, if you want any more information on that, you can either find it on the Manchester Diocese website or get in touch with me and I can uh, find the details for you. Situations vacant. This seems a bit strange uh, reading this out. 
So this is my role. Um, so Alan's now got a job spec out there. It's in the newsletter. Um, I didn't get it quick enough to put it onto the, no onto the notices for this week. Um, and it's also gone out on our Facebook page. So if you know anybody that might be interested, uh, you don't have to stand here at the front. Alan is willing to mould the role around the right person. So someone that sort of wants to get more involved in church life. Um, it, it is a brilliant role. I've absolutely loved it. I'm quite emotional talking about it, really. Uh, but as obviously as I move on to be the school chaplain at Lawton, we need somebody to fill that role here. So please tell people about it. Um, and uh, we just pray that the right person will come forward to just support Alan. Uh, SVC are meeting today here uh, at three o'clock, so that's great news, so please keep our family at SVC in your prayers as they come together to meet face to face. And today they're looking at Ephesians 1 um, and looking at Paul's greeting. Uh, word for today, the new word for today is out for August, September and October. They're at the back of church, so if you want to grab one of those that, and you've not already got one, then please do so. And then there's two slides for the Holiday Club, which have had another wonderful week. That's week three ticked off, only one to go, everybody. Um, ju we just pray for energy levels to be kept up for the volunteers who have just been absolutely astounding. Um, so, yeah, there's some um, pictures of other things we've been doing this week. And then this one was sort of feedback. This came back from Laura Cochran. There's Isabella, her daughter, who's been taking part in the club. Um, and Laura just wanted to send this as a feedback to say what a wonderful time is he's had and she made this beautiful lantern at club and that just shows you just one of the many things that they go home with at the end of each day. Uh, so yeah, just one more week to go everyone. Um, yeah, please keep the children who have had a wonderful time and all the volunteers in your prayers. <clears throat> and then Alan's been looking at, um, there's a Facebook page called Old Leaf Photographs. Um, and he, he sent me these saying these are definitely for the church I, uh, archives going forward. So there's one from uh, a Victory May Queen in 1945. And Alan thinks that looking at the position of where they are, um, it's where the Hudson Room now is, which is just incredible to think um, what church used to look like in 1945. Then the other one is more recent. All the other, other pictures have come from Walking Day from 1977. Um, and someone mentioned to Alan that they can see David Crompton, Marion Davis and Mark Brown on this picture. Um, that's the, the one at the top where the, the choir are all sort of processing. Um, so we'll have to ask Mark if that is true. I think that is Marion at the front actually, definitely. Uh, so that's just wonderful. So we just, Alan just wanted to give thanks to Jennifer Hunt, whose mum, Joyce, Joy Hardman, was the May Queen in 1945, mm -hmm. and to John Eckersley, uh, for the forces from 1977 and then finally celebration corner of course Lawton High School this week as they celebrated uh, great GCSE results so Dylan and Natasha part of our all age team um, they have both got the GCSE results this time and we managed to catch up with Natasha uh, she's now off to Pendleton College to study musical theatre but not only did she have to get good grades she also had to pass a four stage audition uh, so a huge well done to Natasha Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Steph. I just had one thing about, uh, about Corinne coming from Mexico. It's good that we prayed for Mexico this morning. Mexico was put on the red list for COVID last week. Was it the week before last, maybe now? I noticed all their, although they had the highest daily total on there last week, actually the weekly average is actually coming down a bit. So please pray for Mexico that when they do the review week after next, that we'll be back on the amber list and that Corinne can come. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We're going to close with our concluding um, hymn, song, and it's Great is Thy Faithfulness. Now remember, the verse in Lamentations this comes from tells us that God's mercy is new every morning. So if you've come in, as I spoke about, feeling a little way from the Father, there's new mercy available. It's not all mercy, it's not all gone. New mercy this morning. Let's sing this. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you.
thank you for these gifts. Lord, we acknowledge that we only give back to you what you've given to us from your great faithfulness. Lord, we just pray that you'd use these gifts, Lord, now to extend your kingdom in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> The Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. So, thanks for coming. <coughs> Have a blessed day, a blessed week. And Mark's going to play us out.